So Dave's back. He's back in action, folks. This is Jeff Lerner. Never heard of him before. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Rise Together podcast. This is me, Dave, your host, and I am happy to introduce you to a friend who has himself been through a decent amount of change in career and life and now finds himself pursuing passion in placing information, uh, school, as it were, in unconventional ways in the hands of business owners. His name is Jeff Lerner. In 2008, November-ish sort of time, uh, the Great Recession was upon us, and he found himself uh, at a rock-bottom place in his life. He was a former professional piano player, and as he was nursing an injured wrist, evicted from an apartment, being divorced by his wife, struggling with depression, owing creditors about a half million bucks, he needed to find something new. And if you fast forward now, Jeff is a three-time Inc. 5000 CEO with over $100 million in sales to his name, who's also happily remarried with four beautiful children and living in many, many ways a dream life. So uh, in 2019, a decade into the turning around of his life, he founded something called Entree Institute, and it is the world's first institute of higher learning for entrepreneurs, which is now one of the fastest growing education technology companies in the world. He splits his time between running Entree Institute and appearing in media. It is a long introduction. How about we just trim this down? Can we just give the top thing? What is he doing today? Do we have to talk about the recession? Is this important to this introduction? To inspire others with his remarkable turnaround story, I hope that you will be inspired today by his words. Please welcome to the Rise Together podcast, Mr. Jeff Lerner. What would the world look like if we all pushed ourselves to have candid conversations with people who didn't look like us, think like us? Thanks, Amelia Bolsas. Thank you. Sheba Dog. Hey, okay. Let's continue playing. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Or live like us. I'm Dave Hall. Oh, wait. Sorry. Since we're on Dave, I'm also going to give you the last new soundbite. Since everyone stayed this long, you get to hear it. Ready? I love you. <laughs> this one will haunt your dreams. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I want to make this one I get a text <laughs> from anybody. I love you. <laughs> okay, creepy Dave. All right, back to the real podcast. Thank you, Amelia. And I'm on a mission to learn more about this world by meeting more of the people who live here. You may not always agree with everything you hear, but I guarantee you'll come away more informed on topics you might never have thought to seek out before. This isn't just a podcast, it's a community. And when we raise each other up, we all rise. Together. Together. at the stand-up conference, or sorry, show-up conference. Stand-up conference would be funny. Jeff, hello. Hey, Dave. So glad to be here. Thank you for that uh, that introduction. I'm listening to it. I'm like, I don't know who he's talking about, but that's you, brother. Very, they, they sound very blessed, and um, <laughs> I want to know how. You definitely wrote that, bro, yourself. Dave does not write like that. He writes long sentences that go on forever, but he doesn't write like that. So this is from your team or you. So okay did that so <laughs> yeah well so i so i've given just like tops of the trees a little bit of your story but in your own words if uh you were at a cocktail party and someone asked you to describe what you do or why you believe that you're on the planet what is the story that you would tell <laughs> well i will say this I, i've never been i've never been very good at cocktail parties because i'm the guy that somebody says oh how's it going you know or what, what's what's the latest and you know they're looking for super Rachel said this too in her Rage Talk. They all say this, that I'm not regular at cocktail parties. I don't do small talk. I jump into the deep end. I am so deep. They all say this. Like, I don't just talk about boring, normal human stuff. I go to like interstellar quantum physics at cocktail parties. It's like, yeah, sure. Special chit chat. And I immediately go like Mariana Trench, <laughs> 30,000 feet down, we're getting into the plumbing of, of the philosophical underpinnings of the universe. And they're like, bro, I just, I was just making sure. small talk. Like, yeah. I'm going to go over there now. So <laughs> I love, I love your, your context for the answer. So I'm going to give you the way I would answer right before they kicked me out of the cocktail party. I basically grew up uh, 
feeling like a, a square peg in a round hole world. I, I was born with a genetic, I, I'm going to call it a gift. Uh, I think the clinical term is disorder, but uh, it's called Wardenberg syndrome. And it doesn't really change your life. It can make you deaf, which I think is a real hardship. I, I'm blessed not to, not to have that affectation, but um, it kind of just makes you look different. And that's, that's cool now, like whatever, everybody's, when you're an adult, it's like, everybody's different. But when you're a kid, you know, that, that sameness is currency, right? And when you're the kid that looks different um, and then couple that with being the kid that kind of acts a little different too, and is kind of like nerdy and cerebral, like I just had a really hard go. And I grew up feeling like, almost like kind of like in a much less cool, less sexy way like neo in the matrix like i'm looking at a world and it's not quite making sense like i can tell there's some programs running here that are not uh, organic and healthy right and and i think a lot of it came from that experience of having been bullied and having been forced to to make peace with my differentness yeah and, and, and that, that ended up becoming, I think, a, a superpower of like, I'm, I don't see things the way the world, the, the way the rest of the world is. And so all through my childhood, I was always, I, I kind of felt like I was always fighting the system, right? Like when, um, you know, public enemy put out fight the power, I was like, that's me, right? I, I just, I, I don't get the, the matrix code. And, and so at 16, it all came to a head and I actually got expelled from my school that my high school that I was in. And I ended up transferring to another school and it was just one thing after another and I wasn't fitting in. And I was just like, I'm out, I'm done. Trying to fit in isn't making me happy. So I might as well just go be happy. And I convinced my parents to let me drop out of school. And I said, look, you guys were prepared to pay for me, pay for my life until I was 18. So I've still got two years left. So instead of forcing me to be in this you know, job training program they call high school, knowing full well that I have, I do not seek, I do not desire career employment. Let me, let me, let me go my own way. And I'll, I'll, by the way, all I need is a piano. I'm going to teach myself music and I'm going to become a professional pianist. That was my, my brilliant master plan. And uh, I knew that I had some aptitude because I played guitar when I was younger and they did, they went for it. Um, they said, okay, you got a couple years here's a piano, we wish you the best. And I practiced like a maniac, 12, 14 hours a day, all night, every night, sleeping in the daytime, like whatever I, you know, and, and literally to the point where years later I developed arthritis in my wrist. That's why I had that injured wrist because I played, I just played too much, but it took a couple of years and I was able to start getting gigs. And all through my twenties, I ended up building a really, really nice career as a working pianist in Houston, Texas. And what was cool uh, what what really changed the course of my life, uh, other than just you know, I learned a couple things from that. One, if you work really really hard, you can do a you can you can succeed at a really hard thing, even when everyone around you is telling you that you can't and that you're crazy. Because everybody yeah. told me it was insane to want to be a professional piano player, even though I had just started when I was almost 17 years old. So good. Uh, but I also learned that uh, <laughs> well, I I was able to get a bunch of gigs. I got in with this one booking agent. That was Dave trying to remind people that he's still there. It actually started booking me in the home. And I totally, uh, I forget who said it. Kelsey said, sounds like Dave Spade, David Spade. I totally agree. That's the voice I hear too. <laughs> so good, good uh, analysis, voice analysis. Yeah, Dave said one thing and uh, I don't, I'm not following quite this guy's trajectory, but okay, pianist at, he called himself a pianist, which, okay, that was pianist. Um, 16 years old, he quit school to become that. All right, interesting story. Of like billionaires. And so I was doing private parties at the, at the home, like for dinner parties for like James Baker, former secretary of state. I played gigs for Tillman Fertitta, the owner of the Rockets and Jim Crane, the owner of the Astros. And I played multiple functions for the Houston Texans organization for Bob McNair, the billionaire owner of the football team. And like, I'm in these people's houses. It's like me and like 20 other friends. So I'm surrounded by like centimillionaires and then the little $40,000 a year piano player in the corner. And I actually got to talk to some of these people and I kind of got to know some of them because it's kind of intimate. They're like inviting you into their home to play on their $300,000 piano that's worth more than your whole life. Okay. And uh, I would talk to them and I almost kind of got like lightly mentored 
by all these <laughs> wildly successful people in whose homes I got to play. And I just developed this, this passion for entrepreneurship because I looked at them and I was like, wait a minute, they have the best of both worlds. They have the freedom and the autonomy that I was seeking, but they also have the money and the quality of life to have way more choices in this world. And frankly, way more ability to do you know, good or make an impact. I mean, I, I was younger then. I wasn't necessarily as altruistic. Now I look at it, it's like, think, look at all the good they could do. I would play, I would play galas where they would raise like $2 million to, you know, research a cure to ca cure for cancer. Yeah. I couldn't do that. I was a broke musician. I didn't have $2 oh, to go buy Taco Bell. Right. And so we got it, bro. And you also said that, oh, um, and you also said that he made $40,000 at 16 years old. So that's like better than 99% of the uh, people <laughs> at that age bracket. So we, we get that you were, you were less successful at 16. Uh, than these millionaires got the point loud and clear this is so boring so far i'm hoping it gets juicier it's been a snooze fest thus far nothing juicy i don't care i don't know who this guy is i just got obsessed with with entrepreneurship and i started trying to start businesses and it all kind of came to a head in my late 20s i was 29 years old 2008 when it finally the other shoe dropped i was on the hook i had taken out some sba loans like you mentioned it was the great recession I was hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. I was a broke piano player. I didn't know what I was gonna do. And I went on the internet, like Googling in the middle of the night, like how can a broke person make some money or you know, whatever. <laughs> and I just- <gasps> Then I found Tony Robbins and <laughs> poured a hundred thousand more dollars down the drain. Covered this world that was emerging that, at that time about 10, 15 years ago, the world of digital marketing, the digital economy. And I started learning, uh, a lot of the same skills that digital marketers are learning now. It was just the earlier version, the 1.0 version of that. And I, I was a quick study. I've always been good at a keyboard, you know, computer or, or musical, whatever. And within 18 months, I paid off that $495,000 in debt. And uh, that was, I guess I got out of debt early 2010. And so then that's been what, about 12 years. I've just been stacking wins in the modern economy. And finally, in 2018, I sold a digital agency and I was 39 and I was basically ready to retire. And I was like, okay, I'm 39 years old. I'm ready to retire. 10 years ago, I was broke, literally homeless, living in my ex-wife's parents' house. This story probably warrants a little more. <laughs> Sir, the last thing I heard was that you were a 16-year-old piano player and and then all of a sudden you're in debt and then all of a sudden you're out of debt and now there's a homelessness story and an ex-wife you, you left some holes in that cheese sir like i should go tell somebody this story right it's it's like maybe my calling in life isn't just to get to 39 and retire and, and go fishing like i could do something with this and so i started sharing with the world what I had done in the last 10 years and how I did it and the opportunities of the modern digital economy. And one thing led to another and somebody hit me up and said, hey, do you have a course? And so I made a course, took two weeks, made a course. That course has now sold 230,000 copies and given rise to one of the fastest growing education platforms in the world where we basically teach entrepreneurship in, in the modern world. Amazing. All right. Finally, one thing you said up. earlier on is the turn for you of uh, making peace with your differences. I think there's something so powerful. Like I'm in a like in a season a while now of just like uh, radically accepting me for who I am, but also like not even like demonizing the differences, but maybe even celebrating them as part of what makes me specifically me the superpower that I have or the unfair advantage that I possess. Like it it sometimes lives inside of some of those differences. I love the fact that you did that. The idea that if anyone can make peace with their differences, it probably uh, almost immediately brings you freedom, which is the thing that you want most of all. I do think too, there's what? something about, you know, when you were finally stepping into this version of who you were that was different and, you know, outside of the traditional lines of what maybe most would have considered the right path at 16, you fell into passion. And like, you know, we're able to demonstrate this idea of mastery as a thing that you can build with work and time. And you did that. Mm -hmm. And you still had then a, a left turn, a right turn thrown your way when piano wasn't going to be a thing that you could continue to do. And 
um, it was because of this proximity that you had to these people who, who in their homes you were playing in that uh, mm -hmm. you, in some ways I think were mentored, but in other ways I'm gonna argue were inspired. That, that's, I mean, I, I, I literally could care less about what the fuck they're talking about. Um, this is interesting. <laughs> okay, I clicked on his music page, which weirdly, it's linked to his main page. His main page has, okay, almost 100K followers. You go to his music page, he's got 131. Interesting. Uh, and then he's got a violation. Okay, this is him showing the violation. It says, my first live lesson called Pentatonic Scales and Some Blues Improv was removed for violating community guidelines. The only thing I can think that could have offended the AI is when I was talking about slip tones in minor pentatonic blues scales and how they were designed to emulate a wailing sound that derived from the sorrowful singing of the original black churches that were self-organized during the slave days in America. I was talking about how in, in the origins of blues, they use instruments to accentuate the emotion of the songs by finding ways to make the instrument sound like a human voice. I said nothing political or controversial. Last I checked, talking about culture isn't the same as appropriating it. I'm baffled as to how I offended Instagram. If we as a society have reached the point where such things cannot be discussed, then there's plenty to sing sorrowfully about. Okay, don't compare slavery to you getting a community guideline violation on Instagram, please. Jeff. <laughs> Jeffrey. Take care, Instagram. Okay, and you posted 17 times after that. <laughs> and you're on your main account posting. Okay, just to give you the vibes of this dude. Uh, okay, we can go back for a little bit. I'm just, I'm literally zoning out because they both suck. So I'm gonna see how much more I can get through. I would take a very little bit of time and attention they would give me, and I would turn it into a whole inspirational lesson, but it might have literally been four words. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. I think, though, it's like it, I we Heidi and I did this uh, conference last week. It was I mean, Heidi running the stinking show, but there was this moment where she read something out of this kid's book called um, Hope for the Flowers. And it's a kid's book, but it has a like a grown-up message. And it was just the story of these caterpillars that um, oh, were afraid Jesus. of what change would look like. Sorry. Okay, now I'm invested again. <laughs> Caterpillar gang. Can we can we um, can we normalize not reading children's books at women's conferences ever again? If we're gonna read a book, let's read a book that's not children, because it makes it makes me feel like women aren't able to handle a, the chapter books in the library. That's just my hot take. It just makes me feel like, like the woman leading the conference is reading this little children's book to all of her little followers because they can't comprehend language above, you know, a fourth grade level or something. That's what I, that's the vision I get. I know it's supposed to be sweet, but let's not be sweet. Let's be regular. <laughs> Okay, caterpillars, you're gonna talk about butterflies again. Now we're, we're away from the seashore. We're so far away from the seashore, we're now in the cocoons. Because none of them had ever seen a butterfly. And then one of them ends up seeing a butterfly and it gives them then this courage to believe in their ability to become the thing that mm. they've always been. And I think <laughs> that there's something in the experience. The, but the butterfly gave them the courage to become the thing they've always been. Okay. Proximity that is just this reminder Lord. that if you aren't in life with, if you aren't putting yourself in environments where you're surrounded by people who already can fly, you might not ever come to appreciate that's what you're here for. And so I think there's something really beautiful about that. Huh? Well, I still feel young at heart. I feel younger than I have in a long time, but I know I'm soon going to be facing the same issues that many Americans over 50 face. As we get older, we're going to be more and more concerned about affordable health care, lower... Yeah, I'm sure that's really a big concern for you, Dave. ...prescription costs and protecting Social Security and Medicare, and that's where AARP comes in. They advocate for you and... You got AARP ads on here? Dave, my brother... As Rachel would say, bro, my bro, that ain't looking good for you. RP.org forward slash rise together. That probably to hurts him. That's why he said in the beginning, I feel younger than ever. That probably hurts him to have to read that ad read. 
Bitcoin for just $12 for the... He's used to being on the hot you know, young women train where he's getting the, the ladies from the RISE conference and the ladies at the SUS conference all wanting to know his secrets. And now he's reading AR ARP ads. I will say, if I was elderly, I would have not made it past this. I would be sleeping because this is boring. Yeah, I think that when I look back on that time and, you know, I just finished writing a lot of this in a book, so it's very fresh and I've done a lot of really deep exploration of, of that time in my life. When I look back on that time, I realize th the proximity was the opportunity, right? But at the same time, you know, I was in a circle of a few hundred musicians that, you know, we I played between three and 400 gigs a year. So wow. like I was, I was playing a lot of gigs, right? With were you playing the breakfast shows? It seems very unlikely that you play 400 gigs a year. That's 365 days in a year. You have to play every single day and some days twice. That seems very unlikely. Sorry to say, Jeff. Basically, maybe 500 musicians, maybe 1,000 in the city of Houston that were at the level, you know, you had, a, you had drummers, you had bass players, you had pianists, you had guitarists, and you had vocalists, and maybe a couple horn players that like did most of these society gigs, right? And so we all knew each other. We were all constantly in this kind of small, close-knit world. Circle jerk. And they were all in the same gigs that I was. They were all in the same proximity that I was. But I'm better. But I was the person who on breaks, uh -huh. instead of wanting to go outside and smoke cigarettes with the other musicians, or instead of wanting to go hang out in the safe, comfortable, shadowy places with the, the catering crew and the bar staff, and, and I'm, uh -huh. not, I'm not denigrating those people. Yes, you are. I was like in the room. I was like mingling. I was like on the edge of like even being inappropriate. Going, hey, I know I'm just the piano player, but like, would you mind, do you have any tips for a young, hungry person that's just trying to make it in a world that seems kind of crazy. Like clearly you've done well for yourself. Is there, and I would, I would pretty boldly go in there and I look back at that time and I realized cool, my life experience of never having successfully assimilated into a group of like people. The fact that that had never worked for me. Oh, okay. So the lesson is, uh, just attach yourself to people. This is a, this is like a self-help tip they always give. Like, surround yourself with millionaires and you'll become the sixth millionaire. If there's five millionaires in the room, you'll become the sixth because you just learn from your, you just osmosisly learn from, you learn, you pick up the knowledge just by eating bread with them in the same room. It's like, okay, cool. Yeah, so he's basically saying these bartenders wanted to go smoke cigarettes outside those freaking losers. I just interrupted everyone's mail and asked for advice. Okay. It had never been rewarding or gratifying for me. It meant that there was no magnetism in those situations pulling me outside to be like, oh, you're a musician and on the breaks, the musicians go outside and hang out with the other musicians. Yeah. I had never fit in before, so I wasn't going to start trying then. So I'm like, I'm here. I'm going to go to the people that have the lives that I would want to have, and I'm going to try to get to know them. And I want to go to the people who have money and m try to use them as opposed to building actual relationships with people, you know, of a similar interest to me. That, that tracks. Cool. There were musicians <laughs> that resented me. They would actually say, why do you think you're better than us? Why are you trying so hard? Why are you, you know, and, and they would grumble. It was almost like they were, they were a little bit um, challenged by the fact that I was more interested in sometimes, not always, but sometimes of being in the room than being, you know, back in the driveway with them behind. Being a good person and, you know, not trying to suck someone's, you know what, to get ahead. But, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all, it's an internal issue with them for sure. For sure. So that they actually had like servants quarters. I mean, these houses, it was like Downton Abbey, right? <laughs> and uh, and so I look back and I'm okay. like, man, I got the gold because I was in the hills and I dug for the gold. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the lesson is like, there's a lot of people that find themselves in proximity to opportunity, but you actually have to put yourself out there to go dig for it. Wow. I love that. Like part of the, the, the benefit of. I love that. Yeah. That's what Rachel did to me. And I really loved being on the receiving end of that. Uh, 
of that being used for money. I totally relate, and I think that's great. Also, I wanted to tell you. I love you. <laughs> it makes you laugh every time. It sounds like he's really here in the room with us. Not having fit in, as it were, was permission to not care about fitting in in a situation yeah. where there was opportunity on the table. Ooh, that's a good one. All right, so there's obviously this like stretch of time from 2008 to 2019. Talk a little bit about that transition period from pianist to entrepreneur. Sure. So, so bear in mind, in 2008, I was having my 11th failed venture. Wow. So it wasn't like, oh, in 2008, I just decided to become an entrepreneur. No, I mean, I, I, I had actually started, tried to start my first thing right when I dropped out of high school when I was 16. I took a little bit of money that my parents had set aside for college. And since I had, at that point, I didn't actually think I was going to go to college because I like I'm a high school dropout. Clearly, college isn't in my future. Um, I took that money and I hired a, the my the networking IT guy at my dad's office who who claimed to be a oh, his dad's office. Does his dad own the office, or, or is your dad a worker at the office? I hired the guy at my dad's office for one dollar because my dad told him that he would get fired if he didn't help me. So like basically, like I'm a celebrity now and i learned so much and also okay so it didn't help you at all so in 2008 so i don't know what year he became he was doing these pianist uh networking moments but i guess it didn't work if you had 11 missed opportunities bad jobs that are bad companies and where's all this money coming from in the in between time i guess we're gonna find out okay i'm back invested i'm back invested in the podcast programmer and he was going to build me this website that did some magic trick in like 1990 was that 95 i think wow <laughs> and um you know that was back when i had a dial-up internet that was like meh, meh, you know and um so anyway i had this and there was sometimes a few years would go by because i would need to save up another 10 grand to go try the next thing or whatever because i was literally living off tip money yeah but uh what? but i had 11 yeah. consecutive failures and if somebody wants to know about all 11 they can read my book but it was that was number 11 right and so don't make me please i won't be able to keep my eyes open oh so, uh if is there a saying that 12th time is the charm there probably isn't but i'm gonna coin it because and and the, and the the last failure was the big one right that was the half a million dollars in debt so 2008 i uh i launched this affiliate marketing business i you know built a blog started making some youtube videos started writing it was different back then you would publish what are called e-zine articles, like e-zines or magazines, but electronic magazines, e-zine articles. Just a whole different world back then. Uh, there were like, you would create these things called Squidoo lenses, which is like Seth Godin uh, created this platform called Squidoo in like 2006. Oh yeah, Squidoo. And so I was doing all this, you know, internet nerdy. Squidoo really uh, took off. <laughs> Ooh, okay. We're gonna continue. His skidoo, he was really popular in skidoo. <laughs> stuff, and I, I just had a knack for it. And so that was my first win. And I did that for like five years. I kind of escalated from one offer to the next where I would go to a company that had a product or service, but they needed customers. And I knew how to go create content that would acquire customers and they would pay me commissions, right? <sighs> so for five years, I did that and uh, had an that was a total turnaround for my life, you know, by, by the end of those five years, well, I mean, I had, I had spent, you know, when I started, I was broke living in Houston. And then I did that for a year and a half. I paid off my debt. Then I moved to Montana. I lived in Montana for six months and I like skied every day and just checked my internet ads at night. And then I moved to New York city. I lived in New York city for a year and lived in Tribeca and ate fancy food and felt more alone than I've ever been, even though I was surrounded by millions of people. Cause New York is that kind of place. And then I met a girl and I moved out to you. And it's like so cool. Once you free yourself, you just go where you, you could live in a van and make a million dollars a year. It's incredible. He just said how everything is boring and he's sad. He's lonely. He's like, this is so cool. I get to be lonely in New York. I need fancy dinners with the other rich people who I will associate only with. If you are lower than me, don't come near me. I own time. I don't have time to be in the servants quarters. How dare you? I am a online marketer. I can't be hanging out with musicians in the driveway. Disgust me. Okay. 
people, right? Yeah. And so, so I kind of had this, this, you know, kind of bohemian. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> That's his contribution. Yeah. In life. So I went out to Utah, met a girl, went out to Utah, who's now my wife. That's now where I live. She had three kids. She was a single mom with three kids. Fell in love with the whole package, the, the wife and the kids. You know, ended up settling down and adopt. It took a few years because Utah's family laws are slow and they don't like, they're, they're not too trusting of outsiders. But it took a few years. I was able to adopt the kids and now they're- Where are they? What is he on the LDS compound? <laughs> they don't like outsiders in Utah? That's a pretty bold statement. Is uh, Warren Jeffs the guy who's got to sign off in this marriage? What's going on? How old is this woman? <laughs> Sounds like she's 12. My kids, and then we added a fourth kid. And so anyway, I settled in Utah 2011, 2012, started a digital agency. I basically said, okay, I know how to get customers. Who else wants to get customers? Oh, every business in the world wants to get customers. So maybe I could sell my customer acquisition services to businesses and ended up starting an agency. And from 2013 to 2018, uh, ran an agency called Zerly that did, you know, we actually had over 10,000 small and medium sized business clients. We built a sales floor, got up to about 60 people, made the Inc 5000 list twice and, you know, did about a 30, a little over $30 million in revenue in those two years. And now I was a solo owner operator bringing home, you know, 20 to 30% margins. So like, yeah, dude, I'm killing it. Like I'm good. And then I, and then I sell the agency 2018. I sold the list to a, a, a software company, had a, a multiple seven figure exit. And I was, I was just like, Holy crap. Like I should just, what do I do? What do I, where do I go from here? And it was either multiple seven figure exit. What is multiple seven figures? 20 million. No, that that's eight figures, multiple seven figures, 2 million, I guess. Okay. I either. <laughs> right off into the sunset never to be heard from again or and, and i was starting to see what was happening in the world right like gary v had been dripping on me for 10 years and there were some newer guys that were going into this info you know you gary v was dripping on me excuse me sir <laughs> gary v got has some interesting ideas uh not interesting bad bad ideas but I don't think he drips on anybody. One of them, I mean, like the world was starting to show me that there's an opportunity for someone with a message and a heart to serve to actually go out and do some real good. And a there's a huge serve. need okay. for people because mm -hmm. fundamentally, and I'll say this is, and this is like my stump speech moment and then I'll shut up so you can, you can good. talk. You need not shut up. We well, appreciate that. But we, <laughs> we have been educated for a world. I need to sound like that. You need not shut up. <laughs> That's what I'm going to play when I feel like I've talked too long. It no longer exists. And we now find ourselves living in a world for which there is no formal education. And if somebody said, what is it that Jeff is trying to solve in the world? That is it. I am trying to put together formal education for the world that is and is becoming and is not does not have... <sighs> legacy dead man walking roots in a world that no longer exists and that is fast revealing itself through economic catastrophe it's so in okay so many things i mean number one i was <laughs> i had an update with the person who helps me with my finances and i was looking in the accounts and i've got 529s for my kids and they're you know growing over time uh but I also find myself as i see those numbers wondering are we actually going to need money for traditional college education by like Noah's five, you know, I don't know what college looks like 15, 12, 13 years from now. Like it's, she can just join growth day and she can just take courses now and she can rewatch, um, tea time with Noah to learn everything she's going to need to know. I think she's good. Just give her the money to, to, you know, become a pianist or something, a networker. Possible to, to say, because Everything you just said is a thing that we've, I mean, I've had many a conversation about in the last five years, because it's changed so dramatically. The access to information, the quality of the access of information, and maybe your most important point, the actual application of what's being taught online relative to some of what maybe is a more antiquated approach historically. 
Tell me how, okay, yeah, you can sell marketing, you can sell Google ads, you can make Facebook ads from anywhere, from a van in Utah, yes. Can you become a doctor? No. Can you, I guess, you could go to a trade school to become an electrician or, uh, what's it called when you go up the pole? Uh, I want to say light worker, but that's not it. That's a woo-woo term. You're a utility pole worker. You need to go to some formal education. You cannot learn that online with no practice. You need, can you be a firefighter? Can you be a police officer? No, you need some sort of training, physical training, uh, in-person training most likely for some of those jobs or a chef or something. Like, yeah, there's a limit. There's definitely big limits on online education. Now, if you're Dave and you have literally nothing to learn because what you're teaching is believe in yourself because butterflies, you know, were always meant to be, butterflies come out of caterpillars and that's, they're going to become who they were meant to become. Like if that's your lesson, then yeah, you could do that on Facebook. You could do that on, on a online platform, but that's not the majority of the world. And this guy, he says, you know, he seems like a grifter and a jumper from one thing to the next just to make money. Okay. He doesn't really have a passion for what it seems about one industry or one, you know, thing that he likes. It's just like, whatever makes money, I'll just do it. I don't care. Like, that's what it seems like to me, just based on his cadence uh and speech patterns but i think we're gonna need college or some form of education you know i think like going to get a you know a degree that's not really applicable probably is not worth it anymore if you're going to like a private university and you're gonna study you know french or something i don't know maybe that's not worth it or english or literature or something you want to go and get more of a specialized thing or if you or maybe there is a different program that comes up 10 years from now that teaches those types of things. But I still think there's need for education that's not taught by scammers, that has some sort of credentialing system. That's my two cents on college. Lee, like, it's all about... And never forget that... I love you. Okay. I am curious, though, like, just to, to go back to 11 times of failure to 12th time being the hit... Do you think there's something, because I mean, there's gotta be someone who's listening right now, their business is struggling, they're starting to believe uh, maybe a story that they're not cut out for entrepreneurship or they're not cut out to ha have a business or lead a business. I'm sure there were doubts that come in the midst of 11 things not working, but do you think there's just something inside of you that naturally was like, I'm just gonna keep getting back up? Was there, what, like, what, what was the drive? Because if, you know, if you find yourself feeling stuck in failure or some stories around why the failure can be attributed to you, I'm curious if there's a hack. Insatiable greed. <laughs> in uh, afford people. Well, I think I just, I have a really different definition and, and perspective on failure, I think, than most people. You know, we live in a world, like, like if this, if it had been like 19th century Russia, where if you if you start a business and you end up with more debt than you can pay, they haul you to Siberia and they put you in a labor camp for seven years and you probably die. I might have had a different attitude. I might have been like, okay, I'm not going to take that risk 11 times on going insolvent. Right? We don't live in that world. Nobody goes. Oh, so he went bankrupt 11 times, or he's gone bankrupt, he went insolvent. That's kind of using the system, don't you Don't you think? Uh, he didn't say that, but he did sit, use the word insolvent, which is kind of associated with bankruptcy. That's kind of interesting. I wonder how many times he went bankrupt, or if he did, because that's not good business. Debtor's prison. Like, maybe they'll cancel your credit cards. Maybe like, you know, maybe don't put your house up for collateral, but hell, even if they do like they're subsidized housing, they're like nobody rock bottom in America. Like the vast majority of human beings that have ever lived would love to be a rock bottom in 21st century America. You know, like I wasn't going to die. I wasn't going to starve. And, 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 and I, frankly, I didn't have kids. So but but honestly, and I'll say this, though, I do think I. I wasn't going to starve. My parents own a business that makes lots of money. And I am so unique in my experiences. It's like, yeah, people do starve and die because they don't have jobs all the time. It's pro probably especially in Russia. And I don't know. Did they have capitalism in Russia in the 19th century? 
Is that even a relevant story or even historically accurate in any way? I doubt it. Okay. And just, just to break up this weird vi video podcast, let's play a song. Why do you follow me if you don't already own my book? Thank you for the request. Wait, where did it go? Someone requested that. I can't find it. Thank you. Thank you, and... I love you. And... I will slowly buy you a boat. <laughs> okay, we're gonna continue now. I don't wanna be as so reductive as to say, oh, well, it was easy because I didn't have kids, because even since I've had kids, I have taken some sort of tightrope esque risks where there was no net and I was and I did it and that was like because you just sort of develop this muscle of like it's going to be okay. It really is. And and I think the fact but if you think about what is it that most people are really wor worried about in terms of they're afraid to fail in the modern world. I don't think most people are actually afraid that they're going to end up dead. I do. Or that they're even going to end up destitute because I you can do. always just go get a at least a menial job to pay some bills, right? They're actually afraid of losing status. They're afraid of being embarrassed. They're afraid of being ostracized. They're afraid of working so hard, you know, working, losing what they've worked so hard for, which is just a sunk cost fallacy applied to life. They're afraid of, you know, being judged or shamed. Uh, and, uh, and it's like, I, I already did all that crap. I spent my whole life dealing with all that. I never fit in. I was always different. I was always judged. I always felt shame. I, I'd already unpacked all that stuff and processed through it. So what did I really have to be afraid of? You know, and I think that's what it was. It's not that I overcame so much fear 11 different times or 12 different times. It's that I had actually redefined the meaning I attached to the, per, the potential consequence of failure to where it actually wasn't as hard for me as it is for other people. Huh? I didn't catch any of that. I mean, I caught it, but I didn't comprehend it or de devour it, digest it in any way. Uh, yeah, he's very out of touch. No one thinks you're gonna be destitute because you could just get subsidized housing. You could just buy subsidized housing, you dumb idiot. You should take 11 risks on businesses to sell online product. Oh, we didn't think of that. Oh my gosh, he's so right. He's so right. We should just all subsidize housing. Then we can take more entrepreneurial risks. This guy's a liberal, I can tell. I'm all for it. I'm on board with you, bro. Let's make housing costs lower so we can all be business boss babes. Instead of people who have this mysterious cash drawer that just never ends 25 times. I, do, I could just get a menial job. I could just get a menial job. Cool. I'm glad you can, you can get that. Not everyone can. Okay, what what ad do you think is coming next? Sensodyne? Ovaltine? Oh, I love that sound. It's going to make me smile. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify. Ah, the all-in-one person's online is together.com pursuing something like this, and that's having... I know you talk wow. on mindset. I, I talk on mindset. Like there's something that is a prerequisite to even pursuing something like this. And that's having the right mindset. I, I, I wonder if it's having the right parents, having the right career path <laughs> is the prerequisite or spouse in Rachel's case. There were, was there a time when you did not yet totally possess this or were you always someone who was growth mindset? Oh sees yeah, there was. Information? No, no. So I spent, from preschool to 16 years old, wanting, I mean, this is, this is a hard thing to say, and I don't think I've ever said this. I don't know why I'm saying it now, but I spent from three to 16 with so much shame that as I, as I started to develop the ability to have really strong opinions that I could cling to, you know, like when you're four, however passionate you feel about something, like 20 minutes later, you forgot, right? But when you're 14, you can really dig into to how you feel. Yeah. And as soon as I was old enough to dig into how I felt, I had a vein of hatred 
for my parents <laughs> because I felt that they did, they had wronged me by having me. I was like, huh? you knew that you had a genetic disorder. You knew that you, you had plump genes. So why did, why were you so cruel as to give birth to a pudgy damaged child Jesus. and force him to live in this world? And I hated him for that for a while. Like that's how, that's how dark it was. And, um, oh God. And, it, and, and I had amazing parents. They were the most magical, beautiful people. I mean, and I don't put them on a pedestal. They were flawed like everyone else, but I had beautiful parents that now I, 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 I it did not sound like you put them on a pedestal there, sir. <laughs> this sounded like a pretty uh, surprising admission. And I, I applaud the candidness, but I'm hoping that there's some sort of um, like coming to realization moment that <laughs> that's a little harsh. Yikes. I hear myself say that and it actually hurts to say that. But that was my that was how I processed my environment and my reality at, at, at certain times in my childhood. So so no, I was not always this go getter of a person. I, w I went into some dark holes. But <laughs> when I was 16 years old, I, I went on this backpacking trip for the summer, like one of those outward. It wasn't outward bound. It was called wilderness ventures. But like one of those go out in the woods and find yourself adolescent experiential things. Right. And uh, oh, so he was a troubled. He was in the troubled teen industry. OK. Maybe this is where he got the idea of uh, like rebelling. Uh, I don't know. Usually, that you don't end up liking your parents much after you come back after that. So maybe that's where that came from. But yikes, plump jeans. He's he's Dave and him probably have some things to talk about off pod about their parents and the hatred for their parents. Yikes! <laughs> oh my God. I'm glad everyone in the chat agrees that that was a pretty uh, psychotic change. Um, but you know what? The liveliness of the chat is giving me life. <laughs> it is. Okay. Let's see this. Uh, I've li like I said, I haven't listened to this yet. This is the first time I'm hearing this too. So I had a, this is all. I don't know if it gets better, or worse, stays the same. We're going to find out. I had the most amazing experience being around a completely new set of people. And for whatever reason, it just played out differently than it had when I was at home in my life for the first 16 years. And they liked me. They thought I was funny. They thought I was interesting. I played the guitar and somebody had one and they wanted to hear me sing songs. And it was like, oh my gosh, if you change your environment, <laughs> oh my gosh. you can change your experience of life and you can literally, but I was a completely different person that summer than I had ever been prior. And when I went home, I was addicted. I was addicted to how it could feel to not be trying so hard to fit in. Because when I had been on that trip, every, I don't know, I, I think it's because it was a, a, you know, who gets sent on those kinds of trips, right? It's all the misfit kids. It's literally the kids that don't fit, that the misfits, right? Yep. And, in a, and in a group of misfits, I was like right at home. And, and so when I went home, I had this completely different perspective on what it means to be so different, where it was like suddenly something to lean into that's when I decided, hey, I'm gonna run with this music thing. Screw this school bit. I went to a school where they dressed us in uniforms, khaki pants and white collared shirts. I Private remember school. going back to school to school, and at that point I had been expelled. So it was like my friends going to school. Whoa, and I'm like, whoa, 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 you guys whoa, look whoa, like whoa. dorky. <laughs> he said that he dropped out because he had a dream to pursue being a pianist. And now, come to find out, most likely he was at private school because uniforms, I mean, some uniforms are public, but I beg to, dip, given like what he said so far, he's got his parents afford a wilderness, you know, um, behavioral treatment, essentially, wilderness camp, uh, which are controversial. I don't necessarily, I don't really support them at all. I don't know how bad his was. He seems to have liked it, so I don't know. But uh, now you're saying you got expelled? So that's not the same inspirational story of believing in yourself and following your dreams. I've been misled, Jeff. Robots. I'm glad I got kicked out, you know? And I just, everything changed that summer. And uh, ever since then, I've just been leaning into being different and celebrating my weird, quirky, idiosyncratic existence. And, 
and trying to make the most of it and realizing that the more I do that, the more it becomes a superpower. And the more, honestly, the world starts to feel like a game that just gets easier and easier with more practice. I know so much of what you did then next was inside of the digital space in this new digital market. Guys, it was inside of the digital space. Not just in the digital space, it was inside of different. Good place for someone who maybe doesn't really understand the seismic shifts in the emergence of internet and everything that it has created for solopreneurs, entrepreneurs. It, how, how do you think about digital real estate? What do you, what do you think of uh, when you think of the way that we ought to be considering the opportunity that exists for anyone who has any talent and is interested in connecting to others with that? So this is what I tell people. Like I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question through the lens that probably reaches the the widest segment of people out there, which is- I can't wait. All right, this is the big moment. Do I have a drum roll? No. Okay, this is the big moment, guys. This is the biggest advice for all of us. What should I do to make more money in the modern world? Like that's, I get that question yeah. 20 times a day on social media, right? And some of them are like, hey, I have, you know, $300,000 in my 401k and I don't know what to do. And some people are like, hey, I live with my parents and I have, you know, I, I, I make minimum wage and I don't know what to do. And some people are like, hey, I, my grandma died and I have 20 grand and I don't know what to do. But it's always the same. Like I have blank and I don't know what to do. So this is how I divide the world. If you have $100,000 or more, nope. eh, maybe it's more than that now. Maybe it's a couple hundred thousand dollars or more. You can probably make a pretty good go for yourself in real estate, being like some sort of real estate investor or developer. Wow. Oh, this is light breaking information, everybody. Real estate is an investment that you can make if you have $100,000. And usually it's a pretty safe bet because you can live in the house in case the markets uh, go awry. And in case we have some sort of issue or recession again, uh, you can live in the home. So um, this is mind blowing. This guy needs to be on the top entrepreneur list of 2022 because this is insanity that we've learned this information. Thanks, Sarah. Welcome. Thanks for the sub. Okay, I just wanted to get that in. This is very private. It's very secret real estate. Okay. Right. Like maybe you use it as a down payment to get a million dollar commercial loan, or maybe you buy use it to buy some rental houses and build, develop some Airbnbs. Or like, that's fine. If you have a couple hundred grand or more, I think phys I actually think the physical world has some amazing opportunities, right? Especially in the next few years. Based this is him. This is Dave's a question in the new digital world. What advice do you give? Well, my modern day advice is to invest in real estate. Okay, bro, that is no, not digital nor new advice. <laughs> and not uh, applicable or, you know, yeah, he said if you have 100 grand or more, which you know doesn't apply to, I would imagine, a vast majority of people. And especially people searching on the internet how to make money probably are not in that bracket, I would imagine. What I think is coming, but that's a whole other conversation. But if you're in that tweener group where it's like, I'm not dead broke, but I don't, but I have enough money that I don't really feel financially confident. The digital world, like for a $12 domain and a, you know, hundred, two hundred dollar a month software subscription to a funnel builder uh. and some courses you can go get from Entra or a host of other places, you can learn a skill set that allows you to go build any number of types of businesses. You know, you can be in the knowledge business and sell what you know, which is effectively what I do, effectively what you do, right? You can become an influencer or a content creator. You can start an agency. Yeah, that's not working out for Dave too well. His influencer life is not working out. It's not a success story at this point. So I won't use him as an example of what to do. I did. You can become a referral marketer like I did. You can, you know, become what I call actually call a digital real estate developer, which is building properties that are optimized, pro like, like, digital properties, not physical properties, right? That are optimized to, you know, in real estate, they say it's location, 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 right? Well, what is a digital property? Please go on to explain what this means. On the internet, you can actually create your own location based on how you build and optimize your digital property so that the location becomes first page of the Google search engine, right? Or first page of the YouTube search results. You can literally create, you can build not just the- I own real estate, everybody. I didn't know. 
I thought I was a renter, but really I own Rachel Hollis is <laughs> when you type it in on YouTube. So without even, even trying, I became a, a mogul myself, a real a digital real estate. Cool. Sure, but the location that the structure exists upon, once you know how it works, <laughs> and you can become a digital real estate developer. Now, is it some internet gimmicky, get rich quick thing? Like you see yeah. people talk about internet marketing? No, not at all. 100%. But give yourself a few years and uh, you know maybe four or five figure a year development budget, five years from now, I, I can tell you how to be making seven figures plus in passive income. Like it's uh -huh. this opportunity is there for anyone almost irregardless of the financial situation, unless they're so broke that they can't even afford a funnel builder, they can't even afford email software. They so scam people is the advice. Put your money on a funnel builder to get people who don't know what the heck they're doing to pay money for something that you may or may not understand. Okay, that tracks. And, even, and, and a lot of what Entra's done is try to build products that lower the barrier to entry. But I mean, there is a point where you're like, you shouldn't even be trying to build a business. You should just be trying to get a job. <laughs> what if this guy doesn't actually have any money and he, he's been playing The Sims, but he doesn't understand that The Sims does not translate and his parents are just putting money in his bank account every month. And he's like, yo, I am an entrepreneur. I am a digital real estate mogul as well as Kia. And I am just killing it. And in reality, his like parents have just been funding his apartments and his ex-wife or whatever is also just like oh god like just let him he's just on the internet all day playing the sims he thinks he's doing something but it keeps him from talking to me so i just let him think that this is real and you know he's been buying all these fish tanks you know in the sims for the last 10 years i, I don't know i i'm not sure he puts him in the pool and takes away the ladder he, he something's wrong with him but you know we just let him be because he's our little Jeffy, our little Jeff Jeff. <laughs> he's just playing the he's like thinks he's a billionaire, but it's just Sims money. Yeah, <laughs> Rosebud. <laughs> he's like, I got the hack for you. It's Rosebud. No one's talking about this. Doctors are gonna hate you for knowing this secret. <laughs> Rosebud. <laughs> That's what I think. That makes more sense than what he's actually saying because He's all over the place and has not said one thing. Pays better. He doesn't actually know how to play the piano. The piano is actually like set to like the keyboard set to like autoplay. This, this guy has no skills whatsoever. He's just like, his parents have just, his parents felt so bad because they, you know, he, he accused them of ruining his life by birthing him. So they just like set up his whole future for him. Like, okay, we're going to put this like auto piano thing. We're going to send him to our friend's parties. He'll think he's networking. He's not, he's just, you know, he, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, the people that are working don't understand why he's there. Cause he can't play a piano. So they don't want to associate with him. So he's just going to walk around the party and ask for advice. And then, uh, when he, when he gets older, we're just gonna, you know, set up the Sims for him. <laughs> This is all his parents feeling the guilt because he yelled at him them one time and said, you, you're fat and forced me to be born. And now they're trying to recover their <sighs> lifestyle since then. Okay, I like that theory. That's a good theory. Thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> Thank you for going on that thread with me. And for those people, I say, you gotta, you gotta figure out how to get into either sales because nobody, nobody even cares if you have a high school diploma, <laughs> if you can sell or if you're, if you're like, no, I'm too introverted, I'm too shy, I have a speech impediment, I can't do sales, what, okay, whatever limitation you wanna to apply to yourself, at least get into direct response marketing, learn to write sales copy, learn to do video editing, mm. learn to build sales funnel. Like there's always a skill set you can learn. Let me tell you from experience, you ain't gonna be seven figure earner as a video editor. No way, Jose. Nope, sorry, ain't happening. Nope regardless of what level you're at socioeconomically that creates massive opportunity and i think what's so cool about the digital economy is it invalidates the idea that it takes money to make money it takes time and some developed mastery i mean it, you know <laughs> it does up, take Dave. work um but other yes. than that it doesn't take money that's not dave's voice it could be he doesn't take money to make money 
However, I'm saving for my children. They all have they all have four one Ks. I put aside for them because I know that they need a, a safe start, a fresh like a good start when they get out. Okay, then let your don't don't give you don't save any money for your kids. Just teach them the lessons. Prove it, because that's bullshit. Everyone knows you need some money to make money. It's twenty million times harder to accomplish any goal when you start from zero. That's just the truth. It sucks, but it's the truth. I, oh, I hear you, brother. You don't need money to make money. But if you got a hundred grand, you better put it in real estate, because that's my advice. Shut up. Yeah, the bar is pretty low. The thing that I think I've probably run up against the most in my like pursuit in this digital economy has been some limiting beliefs around my ability to comprehend the intricacies of what you have, you know, especially in the agency where what you were working on with search engine optimization or anything inside of funnel building. I, I like I've relied on other people. They've been great, but in some ways not teaching myself to fish has made me, you know, like still believe this thing that like, oh man, it's just, it's complicated technology. Uh, I assume that that's part of what Entree hopes to solve is the ability to reduce that, that the bar of getting in. If you find yourself overwhelmed or confused on how you might pursue everything that exists for the taking for those that are willing to push past that fear. Yeah. It, it, and Entree, his company, it's just like he was at a restaurant one time and he was, he was, you know, the parents are like, what do you want to eat, Jeff? And he's like, uh, chicken nuggets. And they're like, no, 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 you need to look over here in this section. You're, that's not going to be enough for you, Jeff. You need more sustenance. You're a grown up now. He's like, uh, entree. And they're like, okay, on, yeah, okay. And that's what he thinks he's logging on to every day. Just that menu that one time he pointed to while he was at the restaurant. <laughs> he's like, yeah, entree. I started that. That's my company. <laughs> This is all becoming very clear, very quickly. Absolutely is, and, and I think there's a couple ways you do that. Um, one is you just build tool, you know, tools that simplify the execution, right? Like we built some software that's called Entresoft that allows you to send emails and text messages, do CRM, you know, manage customer relationships, build funnels, and it just makes it a little bit easier than other solutions, and it puts a little more under the same under the same umbrella, right? So that's one way. But I think the real way that you do it is if you look at, you know, the entire sort of nascent digital economy skill set, right? Which is like building funnels, maybe yeah, writing copy, although some would argue that AI is going to make that irrelevant anyways, unless you're really elite. Um, doing, you know, content creation, making, doing video. I, I believe that being on video, being comfortable doing like what you and I are doing right now is a is a is a must sir we're on a podcast <laughs> nothing is recording you most likely maybe they're on zoom but uh there is no camera here yeah we're, we're on video yeah the video is every it's in the walls it records me at all times i'm creating video it's amazing it's like actually like a security camera his parents have installed in his house to watch him <laughs> monitor and playing sims okay i'm sorry i'm gonna go back to the listening skill set like there's some stuff but uh. if you look at this world like i think the things you need to do are pretty obvious but the education on how to do them is very very nebulous it's very ill-formed like there's gurus out there that teach you how to do some of this stuff but there's no stanford of how to build a business on the internet right like there's no level of of academic rigor and and you know why would you want that you just said five seconds ago that that's obsolete you don't need it anymore and now we're like well we don't have it we need it pedagogical best practices and like like so like at entre we have like four phds <laughs> on staff and like we did our director of products and curriculum is somebody that just came over from uh the sixth largest <laughs> university system in the country who, and she's been there for 25 years building curriculum doing leadership curriculum design and leadership development so like we're actually building curriculum that look if if mit can teach people how to build a rocket ship we can teach people how to build a sales funnel yeah but nobody's nobody's actually approached it with who needs a sales funnel this okay creating a sales funnel for what if you don't have a bit, you're gonna start your other, the business first before you need a sales funnel to sell something. 
real academic rigor. It's okay. just kind of been this like slapdash thing of like, oh, well, you know, Joe, the e-com guru did it and he, he shot a nine video boot camp, and I went through it and I should be able to do it too. Well, no, it, it's like, this is a real skill set. It takes more than that. But, you know, having, <laughs> having competency evaluations, having, you know, benchmarks and, and achievement milestones and real organized and structured curriculum that, and the other thing about the internet, the internet has like done a number on people's yes, brain. Exactly. Like why do, oh, we don't need college but we have three PhDs on staff. College is useless. These titles are totally irrelevant. We have three PhDs on our staff. It's like, sounds like it's relevant now all of a sudden, Jeff. And their expectations, partly because it shortened our attention spans in general, but partly because it's completely eroded the concept of delayed gratification. It's like, oh, oh yeah. everything happens so fast. That oh, yeah. I bought a course, I need to have a result in 30 days. Well, nobody shows up on their first day at Harvard and is like, hey, I better have a six figure job in 30 days or else this was a failure. Yeah, but when the, the when the sales copy says S become a millionaire in 30 days, we're by this course and we'll teach you how via the digital real estate space. Uh, yeah, then then you expect it because that's what you're promising, most likely, because why else would I buy this stupid course? You know, why don't you give yourself a year? Why don't you give yourself five years? We're willing to do that for school. We're willing to borrow. Yeah, because your loans are deferred and you don't have to pay them back until you're done with the program. These stupid courses, you give yourself five years. Where do you get the money to afford to live and develop this for five years? That's the key. Not everyone's got piano college funds from their parents. God. Hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to a school knowing it's gonna take us an average of 21 years to pay back our student debt before we actually get to start keeping all the money we're earning. And, and there's still a 95% statistical probability that we're never going to have enough saved up to comfortably retire. We sign up for that deal all day long, but we won't actually give an online program two years to see if it works. Oh, come on. Come on. Shut up, Dave. I had a point, but that Dave bite threw me off. I'm going to go back 15 seconds. So Dave now is going to appreciate no college he went to pepperdine university like dave is not a college dropout by any stretch of the imagination so and college is more than that too like there's a whole experience with going you get to go and interact with people there's a campus there's physical things you get to use there's a gym there's memories to be made better than sitting at your computer and taking a chance on some guy named jeff who we don't even know what he does for a living and you know most likely is living in a simulation of some sort yeah, I think saying, oh, you don't even give a course two years to work. It's like, yeah, you shouldn't, most likely. Go to, co go to college. It's a better bet. It's accredited. It's going to get you a lot farther in life. Start keeping all the money we're earning, and, and there's still a 95% statistical probability that we're never going to have enough saved up to comfortably retire. We sign up for that deal it's all day long, but we won't actually give an online program two years to see if it works. Oh, come on. Come on. Uh... Could not agree more. There's uh, there's so much to Shut be up, like Dave. deconstructed or challenged with conventional teaching and some of the paradigm that we've just <laughs> fallen into as the way things are supposed to be or always are. Student debt is one of those crazy, crazy things. The idea of signing up for something to pay off for the next 20 years after. Yeah, it's so crazy that you didn't even experience it, Dave, and your kids aren't going to experience it either. So what do you have to contribute to this conversation? I mean. You can have your opinion all day, but as someone who hasn't had to deal with that, now you're going to shit on school. It's like, I don't, no thanks. Out of school. See, oh, by the way, it's only, it's uh, that and taxes are the only two debts you can't bankrupt out of either. This guy's got to have gone bankrupt like several times, <laughs> is what it sounds like. He's like, yeah, there's this thing called free money. All you do is just like buy domain names. And then, the, you know, then you sit in your parents' basement and you try to make it work and it doesn't and you fail 12 times, you just bankrupt yourself every time. Just do that. Just use the government's money and subsidize your housing, dummies. Okay, I'll do that, Jeff. Okay, now, what, which, who's going to be the sponsor of this one? I'm going to say... Hmm, uh, Liquid IV will be the sponsor of this one. Let's see.
So I was recently introduced to this company called Thrive Market Thrive that Market. Heidi had been using with her family. And now because I'm using it with mine, I want- Ooh, they have separate families now? They're not one big old family? Interesting. Introduce it to you. Thrive Market equals to sustainable. With Thrive, if you want to go with Thrive.com slash gift worth more than $50, want to step dot com slash rise together. All he's done to cut in between, instead of putting some sort of a new cut, like a different little jingle in between to recognize that it's an ad, he's just cut the intro song at the most non, no fade out. It's a little thing. It's just like a little, little, little fade would just help this process a little bit. Hopefully there's someone here that's had this thing beaten in their heart and they're looking for some sign to want to step toward starting a business being brave enough to put themselves out there and mm. uh you know like i would say yeah you should do it and be prepared for seeing the failures that will inevitably guaranteed they're going to happen uh as the gift of what this business of yours is meant to become uh, i'm curious what oh. advice you might give to someone who feels like they ought to do it but are scared to try again everybody's situation is different but assuming you're not in a place where you know, I, I think I actually just want to kind of like nip, nip something in the butt. If you're in a place where you're like, hey, I got 90 days to figure out how to pay my mortgage or else I'm going to lose my house. Don't start a business. Yeah, that's not, that's not your answer. No shit. <laughs> like that is that is not the Hail Mary you want to throw. And so so that setting that aside, which unfortunately is so much of the the predatory dynamic of the Internet is this these ridiculous promises. But like if you're if you're somebody that has at least a a reasonably stable foundation from which you're not just going, hey, how do I make a quick buck? But you're like, hey, how do I do a more fulfilling, do more fulfilling work with my life where I make the same or better money and I do it in a way that I- Don't even tell me that creating sales funnels for businesses is fulfilling in any way. Don't even, I'm a, he said earlier, he's a servant leader or some shit. Like, a, oh, I have a servant's heart. What are you, a priest? Are you become a nun all of a sudden? Like, oh, creating sales funnels and making millions of dollars is some sort of a, a sacrifice that you've made? Okay. I enjoy I or that. get more fulfillment from, right? And then here's what I would say. Instead of starting a business or thinking of a business that is a like a, like, like we have this pass fail mindset, like this very binary mindset that comes from education, right? Instead of thinking about your business as a pass fail test, think about who can I passionately serve in the world based on something that I have some knowledge around and enough real life experience around that I have passion and conviction. Because that isn't something that it is like fundamentally impossible to fail at if you yeah. try. Like yeah. you can you can go online and serve and deliver value and help someone unless you're lying, unless you're intentionally misdirecting them. Like just go be a person of value who wants to help and let the business grow organically from that because then there's no way to fail. There's, there is no fail, the term failure. So when you're in that business, there's no conceptual word or concept for, for failure if you're just trying to serve people. I have uh, a great uncle who was a music theory teacher, loves music, but like also loves the like. Dave is so boring. <laughs> Everything he adds to this conversation makes it even less interesting. I had a cousin once who was a librarian and she taught me that sometimes you just need to quiet your mind and your voice while you're at the library. <laughs> it's like, thanks Dave. Thanks for your contribution. Okay, his great uncle was a music theory teacher. Okay, that's very on brand for Dave. Nuts and bolts behind the music, and he's just, he just loves it. And we were hanging out not terribly long ago, and I was asking about like his biggest disappoint, like were there any regrets or bigger disappointments? And you know, he's he's older, maybe seventy five, eighty, and <laughs> he started to get really emotional. You don't know the five-year difference? You should probably know that a little bit. 
like 77 or 78, something like that. Okay, 75 or 80? It's a little, that's a little big of a jump. About this job that he had as a teacher that he ended up because of recession or cutbacks or something, the job was reduced and he was no longer needed. And it was years ago. But like, this is a thing, like, it's just the thing that, man, life was the best when I was able to serve those students with this thing that I had the most passion for in the entire world. So then I said, uh, do you have a YouTube account? And he said, no, what are you talking about? You know, and there, there is, I think, something of a block for people of a certain gen. Dave's family hates him, too. It's a mutual hate for each other. No, what are you talking about? Shut up, Dave. Go back to Disney already. God. That there's uh, a, a, an invitation for them to potentially jump into this digital commerce space. And I just, I said, look, I just want you to think about it because you still have a gift to give and you don't think that you have a classroom. And in fact, I promise you that, you know, even if you just helped one person with music theory, it might be the thing that lights you up. So I'm slowly, slowly trying to uh, wear him down and have him be a a YouTube page creator and uh, music theorist teacher once again. We shall see. There's something beautiful about that connection between experience and... Dave hasn't even updated his YouTube in like months. Now he's trying to get recruit others to (laughs) to be YouTubers. Come on. Passion for sure. And that's a perfect example. He's 75 or 80 or 100 or something. How is this guy going to figure it out? If he did that, how could he possibly fail? Like, what would failure even look like in that sense? Right? Yeah. Getting no views and spending his time doing something he doesn't want to do in the first place. Failure in that scenario is not doing it. No. Yeah. Got him. T- got to take that first step. So if someone <laughs> is interested in Entree and is wanting to learn a little bit. I thought it was called Entree. <laughs> I thought it was called Entree. That's what he said. Now it's called Entra. Did he mispronounce it like 17 times? And now he's correcting it at the end. Okay, I'm going to go back just to hear that again. Possibly fail. Like what would failure even look like in that scenario? Right. The yeah. only failure in that scenario is not doing it. Yeah. Got to, got to take that first step. So if someone is interested in Entra and is wanting to <laughs> learn it. a little bit more about the kind of service that you provide, what's the like quick pitch for what, problem you are hoping to solve i think you've already said it and how if someone is interested could they find out more so what i would invite someone to do is honestly just go to my youtube channel of course you're going to want to start with this wonderful interview i did with a gentleman named dave hollis come on post it on my youtube channel but uh no so i put all my podcast interviews up there i have a ton of training videos on there i've started doing a lot of youtube shorts to just give people really quick you know bite-sized uh tidbits and, and from there, you can really get a sense, like I, like I actually have a, a general philosophy and, and it's a hard philosophy to live, to execute t- entirely. But generally speaking, I, I don't really, I think information should be free or very easy to access. And that all the pieces that, that it requires to actually help a person transform with information, that's what the investment should be invested in, right? Uh, which is a big paradigm shift from school, where school has historically been this gated, you know, environment of where the information is behind the paywall, right? And so I give away on my YouTube channel more than most gurus or institutions or schools or whatever. I, at least I try to give away more than most people charge for. Uh-huh. And you can go there and you can get a very real sense of what we're all about, what it is we're trying to do in the world, what kind of information we offer you, what kind of transformation we can offer you, and, and probably get a real sense of, hey, is this modern economy entrepreneurship? Is this something that I really would like to take on? And if it is, every single video on my YouTube channel is going to have a link that you can click, takes you into download a free book and go into a funnel and watch a video and buy a course. And, you know, you can choose your own adventure from there. But I would just start them at my YouTube channel, which is just Jeff Lerner official on YouTube. So you mentioned the book. When is it coming out? What is it called? And what do you hope that a reader takes away from it? From it. Uh, The book, it comes out August 2nd. And uh, I I was thrilled and, and, and really sort of like awestruck that an actual publisher 
of real books wanted to know what I had to say. It was pretty amazing, you know? I, was, I mean, three years ago, I was like, like, by the way, I am living proof that everything we're saying works. Because three and a half years ago, I was your, was, was that your father-in-law? Or I was the, or the great uncle or something. I was yep. the theory guy who was like, I don't know, should I start a YouTube channel? I'm kind of nervous. Like, that was me. Your, <laughs> it was your grandfather or something, great uncle, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, this guy's, he's got lots of EQ, this guy. Or, yeah, S listening so well. He's like, yeah, can you just finish up your dumb story about your dumb relative? I want to talk about how I hate my parents. <laughs> Three and a half years ago, now I have a book deal. I have a top 100 podcast. I have a, you know, nine figure company. I have, a, I'm at an event of art. Like this whole thing has exploded because I just finally stopped and I just did it. Book comes out August 2nd. It's called Unlock Your Potential. And it's, uh, it's basically three books in one. It's my autobiography of how oh, I went no. from being a, a broke jazz musician to jazz? You know, a successful entrepreneur. We didn't know it was jazz until right now. He buried the lead on that one. It's a, it's a tactical guide on how to actually do a lot of the stuff we're talking about and take those initial steps to build something in the new economy. And it's also a, a pretty sort of high level treatise on macroeconomics and really setting, Sorry. I, I think trying to trying to recalibrate people's understanding of what's going on in the world at a high level, mm -hmm. frankly, to scare the shit out of them. Like this is not option. I mean, I'm not saying you gotta join Entra. I'm not saying you gotta build a digital business, but <laughs> it, there is no option Entra. for most people to not make some serious and radical shifts in their life or else retirement is going to be what it was 300 years ago, which, which was non-existent. Like retirement's a relatively recent invention. It was invented in the late 19th century in Prussia. It was imported to the United States in the 20th century because it basically- This guy's a Russian spy also. He knows, he, he's, he's brought up several things about Prussia and Russia and, uh, and the history. Why, he's very interested in this. It's a lot of financial services and banking products that you know, we can use to make money from people while they're working. And, you know, most people never actually achieve it, but the bankers get rich. That's literally all retirement has been. But now that we're sold on it, if you actually want to have one, you cannot rely on the system that they constructed a hundred years ago. There's like some new stuff you got to do. And I get, I break down all the numbers and explain why that is. Fascinating. There's some new stuff you got to do. There's some new stuff you got to do. You got to buy my book to find out what the new stuff is, okay? Okay, you gotta read my book, Unlock Your Potential, okay? You gotta unlock your potential and then you find out the stuff you gotta do to get ahead and not go to college. Yeah. That's wise guy uh, advice. You, you, don't, you don't gotta go to school no more. You just gotta go to my entree. You gotta buy an entree. You gotta buy an entree and then you'll be an entrepreneur. You get it? Actually, it's called Entra. Entra, I forgot. It's called Entra now. I changed it halfway through the podcast. Okay, we're literally still not done with this. Please, God, let's wrap it up. <laughs> so cool. I'm sure that it will be a gift to everyone who picks it up. Yeah, sure. August 2nd, is that what you said? August 2nd. Yes, August, sir. Bookstores August everywhere. 2nd. Let's go. All right. Uh, our last question, same question to every guest. Let's wrap it what up. What is the one idea, one quote, one comment to take away, something that you think a listener today needs to hear that you want to impart on them before we go nothing so i'm gonna i'm gonna go very very sort of self-helpy in my answer very Shut personal up. develop not not business not tactical although actually it's highly tactical but in a different way one of my favorite quotes is mark twain said the two most important days in a person's life i think he said a man's life but we'll modernize it the two mo most important days Thanks, in a person's Jeff. life are the day they're born and the day they figure out why and that that Dave, concept of that Dave's going to start crying any minute now. <laughs> awakening to our own purpose, like why am I here, really? And 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 I think that if most people actually take an honest look at their lives, we tend to live our lives as if the purpose is to not die. And I think that's kind of lame, honestly. Like turtles live to not die. Armadillos live to not die. Can we as sentient evolved human beings find a little higher reason to live than just to not die. Cause we're like, I gotta have 
comfort. I got to have security and I got to have a 401k and I got to make sure my kids don't die because when I die, they'll still be alive and they have my genes. And like, that's like so boring and like old Testament, right? Like, <laughs> Like, what is this higher purpose, this higher calling? <laughs> Dave's like, the Old Testament is literally what I'm basing my entire purpose in life on, sir. That was my whole rant, was that God had, has chosen me to become the person who I already have become because I've stepped into myself and I've walked through the shadow of the valley and I've become myself who I've always been. That's Dave's whole thing. Don't insult that on Dave's own podcast, formerly his and Rachel's service to humanity that Maslow's tip of the hierarchy, right? Like how do we self-actualize and go do something that matters in this world, right? And that's what Twain is talking about that second day. But the, the challenge is in the absence of that, we live in a little bit of a, of a perpetual existential crisis, right? Like what, what, is my, what is the point when I have not yet discovered what the point is, right? So the way that you I always find it so embarrassing when someone's like, I care deeply about the reason why I'm on this earth. And then their reason is to create sales funnels. <laughs> it's like, damn, that sucks. I'm sorry that that was your lot in life. That sounds pretty horrible. I'd rather just do nothing. That's better than, <laughs> well, my life purpose get anointed by God is creating sales funnels for digital marketing. Like, Bleh. no thanks. I'd rather just I really just get subsidized housing and just do nothing. Operate in the meantime. Like I promise you, when you have your red pill moment and you know why you're on this earth, like like I had three and a half years ago, you'll never you'll never lack for mode. Like I haven't been I got COVID twice. Other than that, <laughs> I haven't been sick in three and a half years. I sleep five <laughs> hours a night. I wake, I jump out of bed between 2 30 and 3 30 every morning on fire to go crush it because I have a freaking mission in this world right and that's how you can live when you're on the other side of knowing your purpose but until then oh, what are you supposed to do and my answer <laughs> sounds horrible what happened three years ago first of all what happened three years ago i missed that story was i just not paying attention he was telling me timelines like as if i knew this guy he was like jumping all over the decades now three years ago is when he had this big awakening he sleeps five hours a night, he's had COVID twice, but other than that, he hasn't been sick. Well, COVID started two years ago, so two and a half years ago. So, so you weren't sick for one year? Okay, that's not that big of an accomplishment. And you wake up at be, out of bed on fire at two in the morning? No, I don't want this life, sir. If this is my potential, I don't want it. No, thank you. <laughs> God. Oh. Is, it's basically <laughs> stoicism. It's like every day, it's it's stoicism it's buddhism it's chopping water it's carrying wood it's all of the philosophies that are, that are grounded in a consistent daily practice because when you do that you actually create this the stillness and the space and the clearing in your life from which your purpose can emerge and the best way i can describe it is you make yourself the most interesting subject of study in your life Mm. And you live every day as if it's a it's a process of self care and self discovery, <laughs> and most people going through life like I need, I need to figure out what my purpose is. Yeah, but you're not even paying attention to yourself. You're paying attention to your job or your employer, or your family <laughs> or your kids or this or that. But until you're the most important and interesting thing in your life, you're never going to discover why you're here. So this daily rigor of and I call it the three P's: physically, personally, and professionally living through, for consistent never ending improving excellence creates the stillness from which your purpose can emerge. And I actually believe that's the point. And when I wrote a book called Unlock Your Potential and I started a podcast called Unlock Your Potential, what I'm really trying to do is empower and, and educate people as to the method for creating the, the consistency <laughs> in life where the results will be coming all along the way so that you can experience the happiness and the fulfillment that comes from progress, but ultimately, so that you can reach that point of arrival where you have clarity on your purpose. And then at that point, you don't need another book. You don't need another podcast. You don't need another guru. You are the guru from that moment on. That's my advice. That is a good word. Come on now, Jeff. I appreciate what? you, man. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me on your show back then. If uh, someone is interested in get to know you better, follow you on the old social, 
What are your handles? Where do you send people? I am Jeff Lerner official everywhere except for Twitter because it's too many characters for their, you know, you, rules or whatnot. Uh, but honestly, I really love when people find me on YouTube. I would say Instagram, if you have goldfish or shorter attention span, YouTube, if you have attention span greater than goldfish, uh, Jeff Lerner official on either platform. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Ladies and gentlemen, hope you took something good away from this episode. How could you not have if you do me a favor? I wish Dave would have to do a recap at the end of these episodes and like give you like what we talked about, you know, like have him summarize it because I feel like he would struggle just as much as I would struggle. Like, okay, what was the point? What was the, the general idea of that? Like, what was the, not even the, like, you don't have to break it down much, but just give me an overview of what we were supposed to take away from that. I don't think either one of those people could determine what the fuck we just listened to. Oh man, I'm sorry. I know it's been like six hours of uh, live streaming. It's making me go nut nutty. Oh, Rach, but not Rach. Not that Rach. Thank you so much um, for that uh, investment that you've made in yourself and in me. Uh, I will slowly buy you a boat. Okay. And I just wanted to tell you that. I love you.